Welcome to Audio Branding, the hidden gem of marketing. Sound plays a more important role in human behavior and our decision-making than you may realize. In this podcast, I'll help you understand the art and science of sound so you can better influence others in business and your life. I'm your host, Jody Krangle. Let's delve a little deeper. Thanks for coming on to the show, Pavle. I have been looking forward to this, and uh, I appreciate you rescheduling when you weren't feeling well. That was appreciated, and I hope you're feeling much better now. <laughs> yeah, I'm much better now. Thank you. That is good. <laughs> so how has it been for you lately? Have you been uh, enjoying warm weather and getting outside, or is it too hot? <laughs> Well, if you think that it's 40 degrees outside, oh. I wouldn't say I would be enjoying it. Ouch. Uh, especially okay. because you have to do like a change in, you, you go into a bus and it's super cold and you go out. Uh, so I guess that also helps with being more sick during the yeah. the summer. I'm sure it doesn't help. These changes. Yeah. So whereabouts yeah. are you located? Just so that people are aware. I'm in Madrid oh, okay. now. Okay. Spain. Great. Yeah. Uh, How do you like it? I think it? there are also Madrids uh, in, in, in the U.S. Or, oh, I don't there know, might like, be. There are different Madrids. Yeah. yeah. So I have to specify yes. Madrid, Spain. Yeah. <laughs> do you like it there? Are you enjoying it? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's wonderful. Yeah. Um, anybody who comes here uh, wants to stay after a while. Oh, it's, nice. It's the usual thing. Okay. Well, that's great. Yeah. That's always appreciated. It's always a good thing to, to yeah. love where you are, you know? Yeah. I mm. like it a lot. So I um, I always start off the chats here with a question about your early memory of sound. So if you have an early memory of how sound moved you, I'd like to hear about it. That'd be great. Well, I mean, it was, uh, it's, uh, difficult to think about one instance. Um, I think it might have been when I was around two hearing the sound of people playing with snow and riding sleds, uh, in a park near my house in Belgrade. Uh, before we migrated to Chile in the early 1990s. Um, so I, I would think that was that would be like some kind of sound from, from snow, riding sleds. But uh, an even better anecdote, I would say, regarding sound is uh, one uh, which my grandma always liked to tell me. I was around eight months old, and she thought it was a good idea to go to the opera with me. I don't know why. And uh, we went to the National Theater. Start you we early. Went... Why not? <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah. And I went there and for the whole first act, I was completely uh, silent, listening to the music. Nothing was happening. And then for the second act, uh, because operas has, have different acts, I somehow wanted to uh, join in and sing with the, with the people on stage. And that wasn't <laughs> acceptable for my grandmother. Oh. So... She ended up rushing out, and uh, but she always tells me this story that I was uh, exposed to uh, music in this case opera from an early age. That's really good. Yeah, I mean, yeah, music from early from an early age certainly it gives us an appreciation. Definitely, my parents were both very musical, so I was definitely exposed to it at that point too. And yeah. Um, mm. my mom singing especially. So yeah, I think, I think it makes a big impression on us. Definitely. And for you, when this was, uh, when this impression was made on you is like, what got you interested in, in the music of the world? Like what got you into this whole mind music marketing relationship? Well, first, uh, with music, I would say that, uh, when I was around six, my mother got me into piano lessons. And that was my first active encounter, I would say, with music, where I had to, you know, I say active because this is where I had to give something, mm -hmm. practice, sweat, blood to get something in return, which was sound, uh, a wonderful sound. And it was fascinating to see how you could create something that can't be seen, like sound waves, uh, with a marvelous instrument like the piano. But then with audio branding came much later. I was studying film scoring in Barcelona. Uh, in 2018, and I got to compose music for audiovisuals. Wow! Um, film scoring. So where? Film scoring. How, what was the progression from music to film scoring? Because there's got to be quite a lot of a 
quite a lot of stuff that happens in between there to get to that point. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, playing in bands, uh, mm -hmm. trying to compose music by myself, then maybe getting some kind of uh, music for uh, somebody that wanted to do some kind of synchronization between image and, and sound, and then leading up to uh, video and audiovisuals. So I got interested in this, uh, but that was late, I guess. Mm -hmm. 2018 is, is late for me because I was already around 27, mm -hmm. 26. And oh, yeah, you're so old. <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I'm so old. But <laughs> I, I mean, you, you know, when you, they say like, oh, I, I knew that music was my path. Oh, yeah, when okay. I was like little. Well, from six, you sort of did. <laughs> yeah, yeah in, in a way. That, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I had I, I had to do mock-up um, ads. Uh, there was one I, I loved a lot. I don't know if you know this one from Lacoste called uh, Timeless, where these two people go through different areas of Lacoste, um, let's say costumes or dressings, and they try to find each other through this train. Uh, it's it's a lovely one, and I I, I got uh, amazed by this scenery, uh, and I, uh, I experienced firsthand. You know the the power of mixing sound with visuals through this ad, and I remember I composed this music um, in a week, which at the time was super fast for me because you know people now have to do three minutes of music in do two or three days, um, and only after I finished, I contrasted it with the original uh, version, uh, which was by Max Richter. Uh, with those viol lovely violins he has. Uh, so I saw that both versions worked really well. And so I saw that music could, you know, mold a story to its goals. And from there, from film scoring, I wanted to learn more about this field. So after graduation, I went to audio branding, uh, to an audio branding firm in Madrid called Soundity. And you're and, still and with them or...? No, I this this company uh, was there for around two or three years, okay. and then uh, it like molded or shifted into um, market research company. Oh, okay. Like we, we we didn't just use music at the beginning; it was just music, but then we shifted towards uh, market research. But the the interesting thing was that we used facial recognition software and other, uh, let's say, neuro neurological instruments to. Um, create this um, music for, for, the, for our clients. So um, I don't know if, if you've heard that, that you can use, uh, let's say, um, GSR, which is the galvanic skin response, the dilation of the pupils, uh, EEG, and other uh, types of um, instruments to understand your, let's say, your uh, clients as customers and see what they um, react to in terms of music. So you could show them a lot of different uh, music pieces and then depending on the reaction, you would say which ones they are more favorable towards and you could cr create the building blocks of your sound for that customer, for that client, let's say. Yeah. And, and we were doing this uh, in 2019. So we were, I guess, a little bit early and with all this AI, uh, everybody talks about AI now, but in that time, nobody was talking much about it mm -hmm. and it was groundbreaking. So I think that was something I, I liked a lot. Um, but the thing is, it, it was also difficult to get people to um, to understand what we were doing. They thought it, it was uh, very sci-fi like <laughs> okay. uh, things we yeah. were doing. Like, how can you use, uh, you know, the how can you track the muscles from the from your face to create an emotional map of your client. I don't understand. So we, there was a lot of education going on with these potential clients. Um, and that's because we were one of the first, let's say. Um, it it had uh, a lot of uh, educational, let's say, um, we had to learn to, to help our clients understand what we were doing and why we were charging that much for what we did. I see. Yeah. So it, it took education for them to understand why it was costing that much. I mm -hmm. see. I see. Yeah. So did they continue doing that after, um, like you said, they stopped after two or three years? Was it because it was expensive to do or was it? Because it was expensive to do okay. because uh, the clients weren't getting it uh, really because they would say that the, um, 
it, it wouldn't um, the marketing costs for brands were much higher uh, like in the 90s 2000 and mm. then everything shrinked and they couldn't accept uh, these kind of uh, you know the uh, spending this type of money for for this kind of, of uh, research and creation of their sound identity yeah so how are they doing things like this more efficiently now do you think without that technology or are they using that technology and it's just cheaper other people um, necessarily i'm not necessarily saying them but you, yeah. you've probably seen how this is appearing in the marketplace because a lot more people are doing audio branding these days so uh, i think they use i, I know uh, like a guy that uses more the story the story of the brand like for an, an emotional let's say pathway to understand their client and go from there so the archetypes um, is that where that comes in i i i don't know this uh like this point of, of view uh but um it's it's more about let's say using other things that are not neuroscience because there's no pretest let's say um, to get this sound uh before it's released to the public. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no pre-testing, um, which is what we we did. We would uh, do. We would first uh, test different sounds with our clients. I mean, with the customers of our clients, and then the, we would show our client that look, depending on on you know, if they wanted, let's say, a genre from the rock from the '60s. Um, with uh, like in English, this is how people reacted to this kind of sound identity. And if we and we would always show them like two different uh, sound identities based on how people reacted to these. So they already had like an emotional map to this. Um, but I don't know how people do it today. I don't know if they use facial recognition software or any other. Uh, instruments uh, in this um, like field neuro neuroscience field to create the sound identity of their of their brands yeah psychologically I, I, I think they you know they probably have done I know you've done a lot of uh, research into this as well but uh, psychologically I think they're less mapping faces than they are taking poles of emotions after I think that's kind of how they're kind of doing it. But again, it depends on who the clients are. It depends on what the company is. It depends on, you know, who they're reaching out to, what kind mm -hmm. of things that are being shown. And yeah, you need the baseline because if you don't have that, that base, then you don't know what you're measuring against. So, I mean, you probably know this better than I do, but yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I could see how it would be tough, uh, especially without the the face mapping that you were tapping into before. But I would think with AI on the rise the way it is, that that would be so much easier to do nowadays than it was back then. Uh, yeah, I would say that maybe it's more readily available. Uh, yeah. There are different companies that can uh, uh, sh uh, give you the software to, mm -hmm. to analyze emotions. And But I don't know how much is it it's used today. Uh, maybe they don't want to go through all this hustle of, of doing pre-tests, uh, different kind of focus groups to get to this, um, let's say, sound element of their brand. Maybe they they just talk to the board of directors and they, they like this. Uh, you know, you show them the music and they say, yeah, I like this. Mm -hmm. And this is what ends up being the, their, their brand. Yeah, so I would hope it sure. isn't like that because no, <laughs> yeah, it shouldn't be like that. It shouldn't be like that. No, I'm pretty yeah. sure it's not. From the from the people I've talked to who do audio branding, I don't think that's how they do it. They don't just take the you know the CEO his word and just say. I mean, he probably does get the final say, but you know, it's not only about what he likes; it's about what the audience would like as well. As. I mean, you would you would be surprised uh, that it it happens still. Uh, I'm sure. Uh, I mean. It's not maybe it's not widespread, but yeah. I think it still happens. Yeah, yeah, it's something to be mm. careful of. Definitely, I think the CEO yep. has a lot of power, obviously, but mm. it shouldn't all be about the company. It needs to be about the people who are experiencing the company and what they would exactly. want. You know, yeah. So it's yes. kind of got to be that marriage. But you know, again, you've probably done a lot more research on this. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, and speaking of that research, I do get your newsletter on a regular basis, and I love reading that. There's so much great information in there. What got you started doing that? Well, I think it would be the pandemic. <laughs> 
<laughs> because the pandemic was up time uh, when I started, uh, I learned to, let's say I, I found this hobby of writing. Uh, we were all stuck in, in our houses. We didn't, didn't know what to do and I had to move uh, or do something. So it ended up being writing about what I am passionate about, which is music. Um, I would say that was something I would be, you know, very thankful from from that period, even if it's, you know, it's it's a it's a tough period for for, for humanity. Um, and I started writing articles about, you know, the effects of music on our psyche, what's happening to the music industry, uh, with royalties or streaming, uh, how to use music in marketing, and so on. So, I think to the to this date, I've written about four hundred articles, um, most of them talking about music in some way or another. And this also led to, to, to do two books, uh, how to use sound in businesses and how to use uh, sound in the food cycle. And I want to show people that there's another way to think about sound, not just as a listening experience or as a instrument you play with or a dancing experience. There's so much more to music um, than meets, let's say, the, the ear. Uh, so. I want to show through this newsletter and all the articles I write that you know let's let's look at music more deeply. There's there's much more than we we really know about music, and they're discovering a bunch of stuff all the time. So um, we need to make take it more seriously than it is. Maybe because it's so readily available or it's low cost that we don't appreciate it as much in these other venues. Um, but, uh, there's, there's another way to, to th think about music. So from your newsletter to writing a book, and as you say, there's another way to think of music and you decided to examine the relationship between music and sound and food. So I really want to get into this. Why that relationship in particular? Well, I think, um, we love, everybody loves food and People love music, uh, but they don't talk about this mix between these two. And I also happen to notice when I used to play in different bars, how people um, reacted to music uh, and how and how their food behavior uh, changed while we were playing. So uh, I wrote that in, in, in the book and I would see that people when we were playing some fast-paced music that they would uh, change their drinks or eat um, let's say more briefly their food or, or change their their dishes more fast fastly um, there was some kind of relationship I saw but I wasn't very aware of it I just remember that something like that was happening that uh, while we played and depending on the music we were playing something happened with their behavior uh, so with fast paced music, they would drink, uh, they would order uh, drinks more frequently. When we played slow music, they would take more time. You would see the glasses full for a longer time. So there was something happening there. And then I let that slide for a couple of years. And then I started seeing all this. Um, I, I, when I was researching for any article I would write, I started uh, noticing that there was some kind of research behind how music and sound influenced um, the food life cycle in different moments, like um, how can it change the growth of plants, how can it change the perception of taste, and so on. So I said to myself, well, food is uh, considered many things. Uh, but we don't see the relationship with music. So how can we use this source of nourishment, this pleasurable, pleasurable experience we have with foods? Uh, it's even a source of income, food and, and waste, sadly. So how can we use sound and music to make a significant change in all these areas? Yeah, it's a really interesting area of study. And just so the listener is aware, this is the book, and uh, it is quite a fantastic read. I have read it from cover to cover and really enjoyed I'm it, so, so very well done. 
Uh, you also did a, an experiment on chocolate. And of course, you know, there's a food that a lot of people love. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you did this in um, a chocolate factory in Madrid, yes. you were saying, in the book. Mm -hmm. And you discussed that in the book. And I, I'm curious as to what you can tell me about it. So why did you want to do that? And what were your results? So... When I started researching how um, music affected all these different uh, parts of the food life cycle, I stumbled on research about how it changed our perception of taste. So how can it make uh, beer taste more bitter or wine have a feel more full body? Um, so I said, well, I love chocolate. Uh, and I stumbled across um, a food a chocolate factory in the middle of Madrid. And I said, well, let's let's try. If, if there's so much research on on all these other things, let's let's see if there's also something that can happen with chocolate. So I went into this chocolate factory, and uh, the owner was there. And he, I asked him if I could do this experiment, and he said that he was uh, very interested in it because he always did some experiments with uh, chocolate. He would always change a little bit the recipe to see what works, what doesn't. And um, I ended up going there a couple of times. And whenever people would come, like a group of, let's say, tourists that uh, did these uh, chocolate tours, and he would explain how the chocolate works, um, I would ask uh, these people if they could stay for a while and do this experiment. So what I would do is I would have headphones and they would, I would have two bowls of chocolate, one next to the other. And I would ask them to take from one uh, bowl a small piece of chocolate, uh, which was uh, dark chocolate. Let's say it had 70% of cacao. Um, so it, was, it wasn't that bitter, but it was leaning towards the bitter part. And uh, they would put it in their mouth and they would listen to either low pitch music, which was uh, trombones, uh, cellos, and a kind of pad in the low, low register. Uh, or they would listen to high pitch music, which was uh, piano in the high register, some chime bells, uh, and different pads that would enhance this high, high pitch sound. Uh, so if they started with low pitch sounds, uh, then they would go into high pitch sounds, or if they started the other way around. So I wanted to control for the order of exposition. So um, people would know that it's not um, that you listen to first to low pitch music and that influenced your uh, perception of taste after. So I, I did both. Anyway, so, uh, so they would take the chocolate, they would listen to this music, and then I would ask them, uh, did you feel this, uh, like rate this chocolate between one and uh, seven, being one very uh, bitter and seven um, very sweet? So they would rate it, they would then take the next chocolate, and they would also do the same uh, rating. And what I found is that uh, usually people, when they listen to low pitch music, they would rate the chocolate more bitter towards the one and two, two and three. And whenever they would listen to high pitch music, they would rate uh, the chocolate more sweet, uh, five or six. And then I would uh, tell them after the experiment that these two balls actually had the same chocolate. I just separated them. And that must have blown their minds. Yeah, some people <laughs> didn't even realize that they, they would say, no, no, but they tried to convince me that it was a different chocolate because they felt it differently. Yeah. Uh, and it was very interesting to see their faces change and first uh, not understanding what was happening, like, but I felt it differently. But at the end of the day, uh, it was the same one. I, I, I tested it. I knew it was the same. Um, so um, they were, for the first time, they were uh, seeing that sound could influence their experience of food, uh, which was enlightening. I, I, I also read about this, but it was also very amazing to see this happening in front of me. Um, oh, yeah. Because if I would do that to myself, I would be biased, you know. So I, I need others <laughs> to, 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 to tell me. Um, sure. So uh, what I found is that with low pitch music, uh, the ratings were uh, 
in the lower range, like more into the one or two. It was more pronounced. Um, so it was like an increase in 20, around 20% 20 increase in their perception of bitterness when they were uh, listening to low pitch music. But it wasn't, it was mild when they would listen to high pitch music, it was around 5%. And what I thought about this is that it's more difficult to uh, get people away from a base level of bitterness, which is 70% of cacao towards the, the sweet part then making them enhance this perception that they already have about the cho chocolate, that it's already a little bit bitter. Um, so, I mean, it was fascinating to see uh, this. And you would see uh, that maybe it happens to anybody, but they are not conscious. Like, uh, it's not just sound. When, when you see food that has a weird texture or that uh, doesn't look like that nice, you would be biased toward, or you, your you, your your taste would be different towards that type of um, food, even though yeah. if, if it tastes uh, very well. But it's just the 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 visuals or the texture that something doesn't add up to your expectations, and then everything changes. Yeah, it's a multi-sensory experience, definitely. Yeah. There's a point in the book where you talk about the collaboration between Professor Spence from Oxford University and Chef Heston Blumenthal. So what, what did they do? How did, uh, did that inform what you were doing with the chocolate or how did you learn about that? Yes, they, um, well, Charles Spence is the, like the, most prominent researcher in this area. Uh, and then you have another uh, prominent researcher also that has been uh, entering into this, which is Steve Keller, which I think you, you've you already interviewed. Uh, Charles, he, uh, he worked with a chef um, and they found, they, they wanted to influence how people reacted to, to these different um, uh, like dishes that they were they, they were doing i think the chef blumenthal maybe i'm not sure if this is from the fat duck restaurant or not i'm, I'm a little bit uh i think that's what you mentioned in the book okay thank, thank that you for, some of it for... was i don't know if this particular whatever you're talking about was from there but uh -huh. i know he did some in there yeah yeah so they would use different type of elements to enhance certain uh, flavors so for instance the fat duck has a um a dish which is inspired uh, about around uh, seafood and they would bring you the food in a, a kind of uh, let's say on a plate that underneath it had uh, um, sand uh, and you can see the sand because it was a transparent uh, plate and then in a in a shell they would bring an ipod uh, and they would uh, have a an ipod inside and you could listen to uh, sounds from 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 the sea from the ocean and all all that experience which was multi um sensorial would uh enhance this saltiness of this seafood uh, dish that you were presented with and i have somebody who went to this uh place and actually had this dish a couple of years ago and he said that it was uh, like astonishing to have this experience he never had had any uh, notion that sound and other elements could influence uh, his uh, perception of, of food and he ended up liking very much so i have it well a testimonial that this works <laughs> not just <laughs> yeah. the research you know yeah it's fascinating. Yep. There's there's so much that goes into this that and so much more that we can explore when it comes to sustainability and eating foods that we wouldn't normally find palatable maybe, and, you know, uh helping diabetes patients experience more sweet if they're in the hospital or they are just in life and they, you know, need to stay away from the sweet mm. but they influence what they're tasting maybe with what they're listening to you know it's lots of ways to make our experience with life a lot nicer <laughs> and, with music and it's not harmful i mean you can't overdose exactly. on music you know exactly <laughs> like other yes uh, yeah. uh, like other drugs music is not something that you can drive you to uh you know health issues if you listen to it while you're having a medication or something well, that's the end of this episode. 
Thanks for listening. And if you like what you heard, why not tell a friend about this podcast? It's available in all the usual locations. Until next time.